basically this, uh, this bit, it shouldn't take too long. Uh, um, <coughs> I'll try to uh, talk about what we're going to do in the lab. Okay, and um, so we're going to do uh, a few things regarding the solids in the sludge and a few things regarding the nitrification, the nitrification that we started with. So that's why it's a bit mixed, but hopefully we'll organize everything up in, the, in this other session. So um, uh, just one word about uh, solids again for formality. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. <coughs> but uh, um, solid um, is, is, you know, is produced by the uh, fish and by the feed. And again, that's the only source. They remember uh, uh, that's the only real source for solids. And um, the importance of suspended solids removal can't be overemphasized in these systems. Uh, it's oxygen demand, electricity uh, as a result, um, fish health, plant health, uh, controlling our treatment in terms of nitrification, denitrification, we have high organic matter or lower organic matter and the, and the competition between nitrification and denitrification. So if we want to maintain a good operating system and treatment system, the importance of suspended solids cannot be overemphasized. It's real. So, um, so we have to take care of it. And it has to be remembered within the constraints uh, of our system. And if we want uh, aquaponic, then we cannot use whatever we want. We can use membrane and get you know, desalinated water. But it's so costly that it's not fitting. So we have to struggle between you know, economically, feasibility, uh, the operational costs, and, and all that. Who is operating these systems? You know, all these aims and still do really good job on removal of solids. Um, so that's where it's in, uh, important. Um, uh, and so, so, so that's where it can adversely impact all aspects of RAS. Whenever possible, water flow should be managed to concentrate solids in small portion of the total flow. Again, if we uh, want to um, uh, not to, if we don't want to exchange water, now it's another constraint that I'm introducing that fits in Israel, for example, water is really scarce, or in Africa in places, but in many, like here, I don't know if water is such an issue. You know, in Hungary, I just heard um, a, a talk by a, a guy and he told me, look, water is free, land is basically free in the rural area. Why on earth investing all this business and things to, to, to treat solids and water. Leave us alone. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Basically, that's what they said <laughs> with all your silly things. So, and they're right, I guess. So it's the setup is really important, yeah? Uh, but uh, keep in mind that, that we are trying to save energy, we're trying to save water, and with the aim, with the ultimate goal of um, zero discharge, okay? That's, that's what we're trying to do. So then if we do have a zero discharge, you can grow marine fish in uh, Belgium away from the sea. Why? Because the salt is not costing money because you introduce it once and this is it. Or you can grow cold water fish in warm water area because you know, you can, y y you control everything. So if you can do that economically, it, you, you're, you're making your system independent of the environment. And that's the concept, that's what you're trying to do in your in, in your container uh, yesterday. It's an independent system, right? You, you can just take it and move it around. You don't need a lake. You don't need a river. It's not traditional, I mean, in, in that regard. So that's the goal, okay? So, so within these constraints and, and just the rule of thumb, I don't know, it changes, but the total suspended solid is about 25% of the feed. That's what ends up, so it can get up to 50%. Okay, so um, what we're going to do in the lab, <coughs> we're going to look at the solids and the settling property of the solids because settling, obviously if we could take uh, the solids and settle them down in a settler, it would be the cheapest, easiest way to go. 
I don't know, but we can maybe hear how much the drum, you, you remember yesterday we saw a drum filter. I don't know, for me, I got a quote for $20,000. I don't know, I guess it was cheaper here, but I'm not sure how much cheaper. It definitely thousands of dollars or euros or... One is very cheap, this one is actually oh. over 10,000. Okay, so that's great. But if you'd go to the Norwegian, Norwegian company, uh, famous one, I forgot its name right now. Hydro, yeah, Hydrotech. So, you know, they would cost really uh, a good bit of money and with the imports and everything, it's, it's really expensive with all the taxes. So anyways, thousands of dollars versus, um, you know, a bucket that you can uh, basically settle your stuff. Yeah, so uh, if we could settle these things well, it'd be great. And obviously for that, we need to know the settling properties of our uh, component of our, our sludge. And uh, we look at the nitrification and denitrification potentials, which means not really what happens in our tanks, but what the potential of our system to nitrify or denitrify um, uh, nitrogen. Yeah? So um, we'll give it sort of the best conditions possible and see what's the capacity of the system. Okay, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And, uh, but just so you know. So again, for formalities, I'm not sure how many of you run these water quality analysis. Total uh, solids in general is the amount of solids that end up in a, in a, in a, in a crucible if or a, a, a glass. If you took water, you evaporate the water in the oven and measure how much solids there. It salts, it's whatever <coughs> dissolved and whatever suspended. That would be the total solids, okay? So um, uh, after evaporation, if you filter your water through a filter, then whatever stays on the filter uh, is suspended, and whatever went down past the filter is dissolved. Now the filter we're using is, um, is a glass fiber filter, which has no pore size. You know, it's a mesh of, of, of fiberglass. So um, it's the average pore size is anywhere between 0.7 to 1.2 micrometer. So anything below 0.1, uh, let's say one micrometer is, um, is considered dissolved, although it can be colloid and stuff. Not, it depends who defined dissolve. And whatever stays is suspended, okay? So we'll, uh, please. The C to N, yes, uh, it, it, the C to N ratio in aquaculture is usually can be six, seven. Now for most of these aero anaerobic digestion systems and so on, we'll talk about that. It's usually considered optimal between 20 to 30. So um, you either do manipulation on, a, on your microbial, um, uh, microbial population in these reactors, and we just published a paper uh, this year, just about that, or you add carbonate or carbon, you have to do something with it, though. Okay. Um, and in the uh, in, in in the solids, it depends, you know, how much uneaten feed you have. But uh, in the in, in it's basically less than ten in fish feed and also in the sludge. Sorry. Um, suspended, uh, um, so suspended solids anywhere between one micron, sometimes 0.45 micron. It, again, it depends whom you ask, but the standard method is a glass fiber filter, okay? Um, dissolved solids is, as we said, anything that passed this thing. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a water sample. We're going to shake it. We're going to take a, a known volume um, and pass it through a filter that we already know its weight. I mean, we will weigh the filter, know what the weight is. The, the filters has to be prepared. They have to be dried and cleaned. We'll assume that that's what we did uh, today in the lab. And, uh, and then we'll filter a known amount. We'll let it dry in the oven and we'll wait again. And the differences basically will be the amount of solids, the suspended solids, 
per unit volume, and then we'll just convert it to milligrams of solids per one liter of water. Even though we may be filtering <coughs> 10 milliliter, we'll uh, calculate it as if we, you know, um, do uh, pass a, a liter through the uh, system. Okay, so that's total suspended solids. Um, and that's how you calculate it and it's simple. So it's the yeah, final dried weight of the filter um, minus the uh, initial weight of the filter divided by um, and, and, and converted into, um, into milligram per liter. Time thousand, it's because it's, you measure usually in grams, so you convert it to milligram. And, okay. Anyways, so um, then Important to uh, mention, again, we will not do it because there is no turbidity meter here, but what we just, the process we just uh, talked about takes time. You have to uh, weigh the filter, filter, let it dry overnight or four hours, and then, um, and then uh, wait again. It takes hours where turbidity is a measure of light scattering uh, through this sample and you can get uh, some sort of uh, estimate of the turbidity of the water. And um, if there is a correlation between suspended solid and turbidity, then turbidity would be a, a much nicer, simpler way of analyzing suspended solids. Not always there is correlation between the two. Um, but as a rule of thumb, one milligram TSS equals um, one to 1 1.5 nephilometric turbidity units. It's just a measure that uh, uh, people uh, made up, nephilometer is turbidity in Latin or something like that, or in Greek, okay? Uh, um, so you can see that uh, different NTU can correlate to um, TSS. So if you establish this relationship, you can save a lot of time. Um, we plan to do it, we want. That's explanation how this um, uh, turbidity meter works, but we're not gonna use it, so we're not gonna spend much time. I'll just say uh, 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 one word because I think it will help you to remember it's a bit funny. Um, and, uh, I will not say anything. <laughs> okay, so um, um, when we measure turbidity, <coughs> we can do it online and it can help us and uh, we can do it uh, manually. Uh, if we do it online, um, then uh, we need to have some sort of a wiper usually to clean the uh, eye, but there is a light source, go through the uh, sample and the light scattering is, in, is reflected or, or is a measure of the, um, is, is measured. And the more turbid the water is, the light scattering is, uh, I mean, less light goes through, so turbidity is higher and so on, okay? Um, and the same thing is when it's, um, uh, manually done or, or one by one. Um, the total dissolved solids, if you remember that we have the suspended solids on the filter, we have the dissolved solids, the, the, the bit that passed through the filter, and that's, uh, if you dry that bit, you'd get salts. These salts are the total dissolved ion or salinity, if you'd like, um, um, but it doesn't tell you anything about the composition of the salts, and we talked about that. Again, it's a process. You have to filter, you have to dry, uh, hours. So if you have a, a, a replacement, it can be good, and conductivity, electrical conductivity is, is the uh, replacement to look at salinity or total dissolved solids. Now, um, uh, conductivity, it's uh, the basic, it's not exactly working like that, but the basic is correct. So basically we have two electrodes. Let's say that they're a distance of one centimeter away and we conduct and we conduct electricity through a cable. So the more ions we have, the higher the conductivity there is. Okay? And that's how it measures the um, uh, how that's how it measures the electrical conductivity in a water. So basically when we introduce this probe, we introduce these two electrodes into the water and measure electricity. Now, we don't really measure the electricity. Um, I mean, the, uh, we measure the one over the resistance and 
You remember what the uh, units for resistance? Ohm. So, since it's one over, we call it mu. So that's the units for um, for um, for uh, 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 conduct electrical conductivity. And recently, they moved mu. They just gave it a different name to Siemens. Okay, so. Um, we uh, talk about micro Siemens, milli Siemens, but uh, per centimeter, because the distance between the electrodes is good. So even if the probe is uh, 0.5 centimeter away, it will uh, manipulate it, it will calculate it as if it was one centimeter away. Okay, so we have two electrodes getting into the water, measuring the resistance and, and um, doing the uh, um, calculation and give us. So, it's a basic measurement that replaced the TDS, and it's simple and it's quick, very quick. Now, what uh, we need to remember that different ions conduct electricity differently. So if it was NaCl, it would be, um, the, 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 you know, the conductivity would be one. Uh, if it's uh, calcium chloride, the conductivity would be different and uh, so on. So there's the factors between if we want to convert conductivity to salinity, we need some sort of a factor, yeah? So if we uh, divide this conductivity divided by the uh, um, uh, salinity or, the, or vice versa, we get these factors. And you can see that for different ions, the factor varies, okay? But natural water, fish water, generally speaking, um, and that's something you'd have to establish in your own lab. As a rule of thumb, if you'd multiply your um, mm, your uh, EC, electrical conductivity, if you multiply it by about 0 0.62, 0 0.62, and the electrical conductivity will be in micro Siemens per centimeter, okay? Um, times 0.62, you'd get your salinity or the TDS in uh, a milligram per liter. Okay, so that's the rule of thumb. But you can establish that in your own lab, it's really simple. For normal fresh water, yeah? Well, up to a brackish water. And if you really look at the uh, correlation between electrical conductivity and salinity, you see that it's linear for a straight uh, for for a certain range, but then it's moving from linearity because ions might start interfering with activity. You have coverage. You have uh, ion uh, interferences because they react with one another instead of conduct electricity. So, really, the electrical conduct the salinity can increase, but the conductivity does not increase uh, as, as much. Okay, so you we, for fresh water, it's pretty much a straight line. Okay, and where do you ask, where is the uh, line? I don't know exactly to say, but anywhere up to brackish, up to 15 uh, millisiemens, it would work nicely. And you can also establish these lines, and there are different algorithms that are, are represented uh, generally these lines. I don't know if you have a, a conductivity meter in your lab, it can often give you a TDS, a total dissolved ion. I mean, you, you just press the button and it tells you. So it measures conductivity, but there is an algorithm that changes it, um, you know, to salinity. Um, and then we have the fraction which is organic or volatile, and the fraction which is ash, which is really salt in the solids. So um, if we took our filter and put it in the oven, not in the oven, in the muffle furnace at 500 degrees, okay, we volatilize all the organic matter into CO2, and we end up only with the salts. So now we can separate between the organic fraction and the ash fraction. The same thing we can do with the dissolved uh, bit. And uh, we will not do that, though. But just so you're aware of it, because it's really important uh, when you're talking about degradation, uh, uh, digestion, all that, the organic fraction is really important. So, and then you have a summary, and I, I sent you all that, so uh, if it's too quick for whoever never, uh, the, the, the people who have never seen it should get lost here. But uh, uh, if not, then uh, 
uh, but, but the rest, maybe it's just a reminder. I don't know what's... Um, so um, anyway, uh, that's the uh, solids, dissolved solids, suspended solids. Each fraction is the, uh, um, divided into <laughs> ash, basically to the salts and to the volatile, which represent the organic fraction. Okay? And that's something we're going to do, not the... Uh, Volatile fraction, but uh, then we talked about the settling properties of, uh, of uh, our solids. So um, sludge volume index, okay, that's how we measure uh, uh, the settleability of our, uh, of our solids, and we'll do that in the lab. So basically, we're asking ourselves how much solid settled from the, um, from the total amount of uh, suspended solids that we have there. That's what we're asking, how many milliliters of solid settles over the amount of solids that we have in our sample. So for this, we need to, do, to run two tests. One is the total suspended solids that we just talked about with the filter. That's, we identify how, much, how many grams or how much solids we have in, in terms of weight in our sludge. And then we take, usually, we will do it in a... In a in a graduate cylinder, but usually we use Imhoff cone, which has, uh, it's like a cylinder, it's graduated and it has milliliters here, you know, graduations of volume. And we introduce the standard calls for one liter. We introduce 100 ml, but uh, uh, one liter of uh, mixed sludge, and we let it settle for uh, about 45 minutes. Then we move it a little bit, we'll give it another 15 minutes, we'll do it for half an hour, because it's another method that people are doing, and we'll see the sludge settling here, and we'll read, it was 20 milliliter in one liter, okay? And the ratio would be the sludge volume index, where if the ratio is gonna be less than 80, it will tell us um, that the, uh, we have a, an, an old sludge usually, an overused sludge, okay? And, um, and, and it settles very quickly, but it's not good for our reactors, maybe. Um, if it's anywhere between 100 to 200, it's a good quality sedimentation range and also good for, um, it's, it's an active bacteria type of thing. Uh, if the SVI is higher, it means that it never settled really well. It went, you know, all the way here, so it means that it's fluffy, usually it's actinomycetes, or it, very young sludge also behave like that. It doesn't settle very well. So we can identify where we are, and we can design our things, or, 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 um, or uh, try to direct our sludge into, uh, into a better performance in terms of settling, because we just said that settling is what we really want, because it's the simplest method of removing uh, solids. So what we're going to do in the lab um, is the following. We're going to do TSS, and these are, you, you got it in your, uh, in your computers, uh, in the mail. So the TSS will pre-weigh dry, will pre dry filters, uh, will um, uh, filter it through a filtration apparatus, we'll see that, okay? We'll wait for about four hours in the oven, and we'll calculate the TSS. With settleable solids, we'll do this experiment. Take a poor 100 ml water into a graduate cylinder. We'll wait 30 minutes. Uh, we'll move it a bit and wait a bit more and uh, look at the milliliter per liter uh, of settleable solids and then calculate the SVI. So that's one thing we're gonna do. And then the nitrification potential. So for nitrification, when we try to, I mean, to find the highest rate or the highest capacity of our system. So we'll take ammonia as a, as a starting, uh, as an as a artificial solution, a um, uh, solution with high ammonia concentration. We'll have a buffer, so um, pH would not change, so it would give it uh, a nice, um, uh, uh, so it won't change over time, uh, the, the pH, because it affects the nitrification rate. We'd give it uh, a good, temp I mean, a temperature that is typical for nitrification, but in this case, we'll use the water, the, 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 the fish water temperature around 25, 28, okay? And um, we'll introduce that 
into uh, 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 and will introduce the um, media, the nitrification media that we want to test, uh, and we'll take these media from uh, two reactors in the, um, the, the the two facilities. I mean, the two systems that we saw yesterday. One is from this um, uh, bead filter, and the other one is from this rock material, rock filter. Okay, so we introduce it into the bottle, and now since nitrification consume. Uh, Oxygen, we can measure the oxygen consumption and calculate it, calculate as if it was uh, um, nitrification, correlate that. We'll measure ammonia, so we'll see how much ammonia is removed. We'll measure nitrate, so we can see how much nitrate is produced. And since it's a process that consumes alkalinity, we can also measure alkalinity and see the change, the, the reduction in alkalinity, and see that. Uh, what was the reduction? And if we can see that, the buffer will may interfere with that. We don't introduce buffer there, did we? We didn't, or just a little bit, because otherwise, anyways. So we'll see the we need some alkalinity, and I'm not sure how much alkalinity there is in this water here. So um, so we'll see the change in alkalinity. All these three measures will give us really good indication of the nitrification potential in this. Uh, system, so we will run all these analyses: nitrate, nitrate, ammonia, alkalinity, and oxygen. Okay, and that's how that was going to go. And pH. and pH, right? Because pH, again, would uh, is likely to change because we produce acidity. The denitrification potential, the concept would be uh, the same, but this time we need we must not have oxygen in our. Um, in our sludge because it has to be without oxygen. So we will remove the oxygen. The way we did it, we added carbon source yesterday to the sludge. We added sugar. Um, so the bacteria are active and um, they consumed all the oxygen. I'm pretty sure that the oxygen now in the uh, sludge would be zero. If not, we will, uh, we will make it zero, right? <laughs> we'll shout at it. And um, uh, we'll convince it to be zero. And then um, um, we'll introduce nitrate, and we'll introduce some carbon source if it, just to make sure we, it's not a limiting factor. So we can introduce sugar or something, yeah, citrate, whatever. So um, and then we can uh, we'll seal it so we don't get oxygen from the atmosphere. We'll seal it in, in, in with a cup, and we'll let it stand for several hours, and we will see how much nitrate uh, went down how much alkalinity is produced, um, and so on. Um, and then we'll de de determine the um, denitrification potential. By doing that, if we measured it over time, not only one in the beginning, one in the end, but over time, several times we could have established the figure to determine the monod or the michaelis menten relationship and get the Ks and the Qmax. Okay? Now, um, just one more thing in the lab, um, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll do that. Uh, we will have to measure oxygen because we need to measure oxygen consumption, and we need to make sure that our denitrification is um, without oxygen. So we're going to use, I don't know what meters you have, but usually there are two type meters that are available out there. One is Membrane-like, that's the traditional uh, method after Winkler, which is a chemical method. Uh, but uh, there you have a membrane and solution, and it's, uh, it's, um, this membrane is um, selective for oxygen, so only oxygen can get in, and the potential it creates between the environment and the probe uh, creates some sort of a, a, a current, which was um, translated into oxygen. Now, um, this, the problem with this method is that it consumes oxygen. So if there is no water flow or water mixing, then the oxygen meter can be inaccurate if you want to measure things over time. The, 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 the newer version of the electrodes are optical sensors. And if we're here and talking about that, I'll say a word about it. But basically, the idea is that if you introduce light on different um, uh, material, the uh, different compounds, chemicals, they illuminate. Okay, they, lumine, they have lumine, lumine essence. So um, 
uh, and um, there are several materials that are the lumini essence uh, is affected by the uh, oxygen concentration. So the more oxygen you have, it illuminate less. Okay. So if you have no oxygen, it will illuminate uh, more. And the more oxygen you have, it illuminates less. And you can correlate between the luminance time to, uh, uh, to the uh, concentration of oxygen. So that's the other method. And that's uh, obviously solved the problems of, uh, of uh, flowing water and so on. It's way more resilient and very uh, accurate. And also not so much in affected by, well, we don't know that. but. Uh, uh, less the, the, the thing is how turbidity affects it and things like that, that's still a question. pH, these are different uh, regular probes. Um, how do we going to do that? So we're, we, we're going to divide into um, six groups or so, um, two and three, I guess, otherwise it'd be too boring. Uh, we will have, um, um, we'll have three, um, three stations. Uh, one with Boris that would not be solid analysis, that would be the water quality because it's, uh, it's, uh, he knows how to operate it there. Um, Uri will work with the nitrification, denitrification, and I will be at the solid uh, station and we'll, two groups, you know, uh, will come each time, we'll do our stuff and move to the other. And I think um, then once we're ready, everyone has his own, I mean, has all the data, uh, we'll quit. <laughs> we'll have lunch and we'll talk a little bit more or not, I can't remember, then we'll come back to the lab. I think we first go back to the lab and then talk or the other way around, I can't remember what's in the plan. That's the deal. You say there? Fine. So, um,